you turn with me, please, in the Word of God into uh, Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. We invite you back out tonight. Should the Lord tarry, it's 530. We have prayer in the sanctuary. If you just come in and find your place to pray and seek the Lord. And then tonight at the 6 o'clock service, uh, Brother Larry Anderson, former pastor of Abundant Life Church of God, uh, will be our guest speaker tonight. Larry's a dear friend, a great preacher, and I think you'll enjoy uh, his ministry. I hope you'll be back for that this evening. In Exodus chapter 3, uh, by the way, for returning there, we will have communion at the end of the service. If you've not picked up your uh, cups so far, feel free to go to the back door and pick them up at either side of the door. They're there, so feel free to go th get them uh, for you and your family if you missed it this morning. But in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, I want to talk to you about a subject entitled that God knows what He is doing. You ever feel like God doesn't know what He's doing? I remember years ago on radio, a lady said, Lord, pray for Jesus because <laughs> he needs help. Well, the Lord don't need help. Uh, he knows exactly what uh, he's doing. A life for the children of Israel had become difficult in the land of Egypt. Uh, they had been in the land of Egypt and the troubles were bigger than they were. Uh, life had become hard. Life had become extremely heavy. For 430 years, they found themselves living in slavery. And during those 430 years living in slavery and bondage there in Egypt itself, they had no choice but to cry out to God that He might come and help them, hear them, and deliver them from the problems that they found themselves in. Vance Habner, an old-time preacher from the foothills of North Carolina, an old pastor I love reading after, said, and I quote, uh, The tragedy of our time is that the situation is desperate, but the saints are not. End of quote. I believe sometimes, friend, like the children of old, maybe we're like that today. Maybe the situation you're going through, the pain you're going through, the injustice that you're going through, the disease that you're going through, whatever it is that you're going through, maybe it's so bad today you don't know what to do. But like the children of Israel of old, they cried out to God in desperation. They may have cried in desperation. They may have cried in frustration. They may have cried out of obligation. But the truth of the matter is they cried out to God. And they cried in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their confusion, in the midst of their isolation, in the midst of their bondage and slavery, in the midst of the unfair treatment, they cried out to the true and to the living God. Have you ever lived to a point in your life where you begin to question God? Do you feel like sometimes that you're going through things in life you don't understand and you think, God, you're a million miles away? It seems like that you are where you are because you've been led of the Lord to get there. And all of a sudden, it seems like God's just forgotten where you are. It seems like you're there all by yourself and God seems to be a million miles away. And you wonder, God, do you see where I'm at? Uh, do you understand where I'm at? Do you feel what I feel? Is there any help whatsoever uh, for me in the situation that I find I'm in? We feel like as if though God's a million miles away and we find yourself consumed with grief, uh, consumed with pain and we wonder, God, do you really even care? I know what the Bible said, God loves me, but where's that love at right now with the pain I'm in? Uh, God, you said your eyes are upon the everybody and everything, but God, do you see exactly uh, where I'm at in my life today? We, let me tell you, friend, we all go through times in life that we don't understand what we're going through as we're living. We all go through things in life that we simply do not understand and we don't have the answers to. I don't understand how a young man that was getting ready to graduate Bible college with a bright future in ministry ahead of him, and yet he was killed in a car wreck uh, before he graduated. I don't understand how come a person, a father, and a, son, and a husband dies uh, without any warning. I don't understand why a woman who is at home uh, raising six or seven kids needed by the children uh, needs her desperately, and yet she uh, dies by some hideous disease. I don't understand why there's some kind of an earthquake or a tornado or, or some type of a hurricane uh, that comes in and devastates communities and, and cities and villages and towns and sometimes even states and leaves nothing but death and destruction uh, within its pathway. I don't understand this morning how a drunk driver can walk away from a car wreck while not a scratch on him and the people in the other car didn't survive whatsoever. I don't understand how you work and you work to your bones, uh, your knuckles down to the bones and, and still 
until you don't have enough money uh, to have uh, at the end of the month to make ends even meet. And I don't understand uh, how with all my heart, uh, how in the world uh, the results come back positive from a test from the doctor when you prayed and prayed and prayed that everything would be okay. When you get things like that, you can't help but scratch her and say, God, where are you? Why do you allow me to go through this? Where were you at? Did you not hear and answer the prayer as the pastor said you did? Where are you at? Who, who knows? God, good people have faced many difficult situations in all periods of history. In the Old Testament, the New Testament, and even today. As we arrive at our text this morning, I'm going to read in a moment. We see the nation of Israel were living in fear and living in bondage and living in slavery. They were in some terrible times. There's no doubt in my mind that these men and women in Israel in Egyptian bondage, I believe they question God where are you at? Why are we going through what we're going through? As you read these verses, you will find out that God not only saw where they were at, he was concerned about where they're at, and they did something about where they were at. Exodus records one of the greatest stories that you and I will read in the entirety of the Old Testament, and that is the fact that God miraculously delivered the nation of Israel from the tyranny and the slavery of Egyptian bondage. Now you will recall that Moses uh, was raised as the daughter of Pharaoh. He was educated with the finery of Egypt. Uh, he had the best education that Egypt the world could give. Uh, he knew all the necessities and niceties uh, that Egypt had to offer. Uh, he was raised in royalty. He was raised uh, with a gold spoon in his mouth, so to speak, after the adoption. And they were grooming Moses uh, to be the commander to sit upon the throne in all of Egypt. But the story said that one day Moses saw a Jew and Egyptian fighting among themselves uh, Moses goes to break it up and in reality he kills the Egyptian and he buries him in the sand uh, but finally his sin was exposed and as a result uh, Pharaoh found out about it and he was vehemently upset with Moses and was going to kill him but Moses fled for his life uh, he ran to the backside of the desert and there he lived for 40 long years he married Jethro's daughter uh, the prince of media uh, and there he had his own family and tried to live a life the way that he could. But I remind you, uh, we go now back to Egypt, and the story begins. The Bible said, Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help uh, because of the bondage ascended to God. So God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. And the Lord said, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their outcry because of the taskmasters, for I'm aware of their sufferings. So I have come down uh, to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up into a land, to a good and a spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, and to the place uh, of Canaanite, the Hittite, Amorite, the Pezzarite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. And now, behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen their oppression which, with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Friends, here are some truths that help you and me as we feel like we are all alone and forgotten about in the situation where we may be living today. I remind you, is there a God in heaven? And if so, does he really care? Do you ever feel like, God, do you really care about me? Let me see your hands. Be honest with me. There are many of us. God, do you really care? I'm going to tell you, God does care. God does see. God does hear. And God will answer by the power of his Holy Spirit. The Bible makes it clear that God is with us and God does care. First of all, he said, I have seen the afflictions of my people which are in Egypt. Affliction means something that causes pain or suffering. God saw his people. They were led into the Egypt under Jacob. You recall there was famine in the land and they found there was food in Egypt. So Joseph through circumstances God sent before. 
and he was second in command of all of Egypt. And Jacob and his sons show up and they get light in Goshen and they're embraced. The Egyptians love them and they put them in Goshen. But the thing of it is, there was a king, Pharaoh that died that did not remember or know Joseph. As a result of the people of Israel began to multiply and they were getting bigger and bigger and bigger in multiplication. I mean, they went from uh, hand, uh, the 70 to a uh, millions of them. And the, 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 the Egyptians said, we had better put them under some strict obedience. We better have make them slaves uh, unless they multiply bigger than we are and they join an opposing country and they will defeat us in our own nation. They were there in the will of God. And all of a sudden, while they're in the will of God, God, through a miracle, saved the entire nation. But now they're in the will. They're, they're now in Egypt. And now they're in pain. They're in servitude. I'm going to tell you, God knows all about the situation you are in. If God knew where the children of Israel were at in the text, God knows where you are in your life today. And let me say this. You couldn't hide from God if you wanted to. If you can't hide from God when the sun's shining, you can't hide from God through the midnight hour. If you can't hide from God when you're on top of the mountain, you can't hide from God when the mountain is on top of you. If you can't hide from God any time of your life, you're not able to hide from God when you're going through your most difficult valley, through your most difficult oppression, through the difficult pain, whatever, you can't hide from God. Every hair on your head is numbered. He knows your ups and your downs, your beginning and your end. He knows where you are right now and you are where you are more times than not by divine appointment. Amen. So wherever God leads you, God will take care of you. Amen. He saw, he saw the afflictions of the people. There's never a problem we, that we have that goes unnoticed by the Father. He sees the pain you're in. Uh, he sees the heartache of your life. He sees what gives you the headache. He knows what keeps you up at night, tossing and turning in your bed. He knows what gives you uh, pain and heart pain uh, throughout the day of your life. Thank God he sees the tears. He sees the burden you carry. He sees the grief and the worry and the despair within your heart now. He saw the misunderstanding that took place in your life. He sees the unfair treatment that comes against you. He sees and he knows the one who injured you and gossips about you and spread those false rumors all about you. He, the Heavenly Father, sees the torment that goes on in your mind. He sees the path that you were forced to take by your own sin and the dilemma that you find yourself in today. He sees the pain of your disease. He sees the pain of your separation. He sees the pain of your divorce. He sees the pain of the death that you've experienced. He sees the pain of the financial problem. He sees the pain that the prodigal son and the prodigal daughter has brought your way. He sees the affliction that's brought about in general in your life this morning. In Egypt, the children of Israel, they were forced to work and labor in inhumane conditions. Uh, forced to work in conditions that were grossly unfair. Uh, forced to give more uh, with little. And the stress and strain they found every day, they could not bear it anymore. And I believe they said, God, do you see us? God, do you hear us? God, do you know what we're going through? And the pain or the problem put them to their knees and they cried out to the living God. Let me tell you, friend, there are times we go through life, we've done all we know to do. We've taken all the medicine. We've gone all the doctors. We've gone to all the counseling. We've taken all the granny's homemade medicine. Let me tell you, there comes a time you got to fall down on your knees and cry out to the living God and say, God, unless you move, I'm going to die. Unless you come through, I'm not going to make it. Unless you touch me, I'm not going to move. But the point is, we can call upon a God that will do what he said he would do, but we got to cry out. Amen. We got to cry out. God saw the reflection no matter where you are, no matter what you're facing, no matter how much problem is upon you, he knows what you're going through. In fact, he sees your affliction. God does not sleep and our God does not slumber. While you're wearing the bed out at 12 o'clock at night, God has his eye on the sparrow and God has his eye upon you. And if God loves the birds that fly in the air, how much more does God love and concerned about you? But we move on. Oh, does God hear their, hear their affliction? God hears their cries. He said, I consider the life of living in Egypt during that time. They were bound in slavery. They were working in unbearable conditions. And they, the sons were born to die at the king's command. And all these things they went through year in and year out. They were discouraged. And they probably wondered what in the world is the use to crying out to God. Do you ever feel that way? 
God, I know you know where I'm at, but I cry out and nothing happens. God, you know where I'm at, but what, nothing changes. I wake up today and it's the same old road of more bad miles like yesterday and the year before. 430 years, they were living in bondage. And every year it got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And as it gets worse and worse, the devil sits here and says, you're a fool. God's dead. He don't see. If he does, he doesn't care. He doesn't love you. You're different than somebody else. Blah, yada, yada, yada. And we believe that hook, line, and sinker. What's the use of crying out to God? A theological student came one time to Charles Spurgeon, greatly concerned that he couldn't understand the passage of Scripture. And Charles Spurgeon firmly but kindly said, Young man, allow me to give you this word of advice. Give the Lord credit for things you don't understand. Give the Lord credit for things you and I do not understand. There were a lot of times I've asked my children to do things they didn't understand. And I know it made no sense to them. But they had to trust my heart and trust my love. And there are times we go through we don't understand. But God knows what he's doing when we don't understand. And it's in those moments that we've got to trust him with our love. God knew what the children were facing. He saw their affliction. He heard their cries. God knows every tear that you shed. Friend, it doesn't matter how difficult your situation. God hears your cries. He knows the circumstances that you're going through. And the question is, are you crying out to him? There's sometimes we face the same old dilemma so long. We've been in that pain for so long. We've heard the doctor's report for so long, et cetera, et cetera, that we just, I'm giving up. Friend, that's not time to give up. It's a time to get on your knees and cry out to God the louder. Cry out to God the louder. God hears your cries. Thank God it doesn't stop there. I know their sorrows, he says. God knew about every strike of every whip that the Egyptian put upon the back of those Jewish people. God knew about the pain they experienced at the end of every day. God knew about their sorrow. The prophet Isaiah said, For thus saith a high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble heart to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of of the contrite ones. Jesus Christ came as a man of sorrow. He knows what you're going through. I want to tell you something, church. We must tell Jesus what's going on in our life. Well, if he knew, he'd come do something. Let me tell you something, beloved. I've had this happen through the years. I remember years ago, my first church ever pastored, I went to the hospital at 4 o'clock one morning. One of my board members, wife, was having surgery. I walked in, and the first thing out of her mouth, about time you showed up. I had you at the surgery. You never showed up. I said, I didn't know you had surgery. Nobody told me. Well, you ought to tell you the pastor. Well, I found out about this one, so I'm here. But I didn't know about the other two. Well, you should have. You're the pastor. Explain that to me. If you didn't tell me, and your husband didn't tell me, how was I supposed to know? And we do God that way. But you're God. You know what I'm going through. You've got to do something about it. God has limited himself to our prayers in many cases. It's not that he can't. It's we often won't let him. Because we've got to call. We've got to pray. We've got to cry. And I believe as we do these things, God will hear. I'm telling you, when I go through problems and I go through pain and I go through sorrow and I go through misunderstanding, I go through things that rips my heart out just like you do, I don't need Job's comforters trying to help me. I don't need people telling me what I ought to do and what I did wrong and how to blah, blah, blah. I've had too many of those guys. And I'll be honest with you, thank God for them, but the spirit of slap just comes all over me. (laughs) And you know what I'm talking about. I want somebody that can identify with me. I want somebody I can talk to that understands the mind of God and understands the mind of Jeff Davis and understand what it's like to be human but know what it's like to be divine. There's only one man. We have a great high priest. His name is Jesus Christ the Lord. He ever lives to make intercession for the saints of God. He is touched by the feeling of my infirmity. He knows when I hurt. He knows when I'm going through. He knows everything about us and he is concerned about you, friend. No matter what the devil said, he loves you and he's concerned about you. He sees, he 
hears, and he'll do something about it. I need someone I can turn to that really cares and really has the answer to my trouble. No wonder the songwriter penned the words. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. It's in those moments when there's pain on your back from the stripes by the Egyptian soldier. When your mind is tore up, when the lies of hell are bombarding your mind, it's in those moments you have to fall on your face. God, if I live or die, if he lives or he dies, she lives, she dies. It works or don't, I trust Jesus. I've made up my mind. I can't go back. I've made up my mind. I've got to go forward. I've made up my mind. Oh, but let me tell you something else. God sees, God hears, God knows, and with all that knowledge and love for us, He comes down to deliver us. I come down to deliver them. Can you say it with me? I come down to deliver them. Praise God. I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into a good land, a large, and uh, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Here we see that God moves from compassion to action. We serve a God that moves with action. I don't know what you're facing today, but God is no respecter of persons. If he knows all the details, and he does, and he knows the reason behind them, I would encourage you to trust him and to look for him to come through. Now, what about old Moses? Moses spent 40 years in Pharaoh's court. Man, I am the big cheese in this factory. Then he spent 40 years on the backside of the desert thinking he was a nobody. But one day while he's at the Mount of God, Horeb, keeping his father-in-law's sheep, the priest of Midian, all of a sudden he looks over and he sees a bush burning. And the thing about the bush, it wasn't burning down and it wasn't burning up. And curiosity got him, so he walks over, and the more he, closer he walks, the more of a wholeness he feels. Take your shoes off, son. You're on holy ground. And Moses saw that bush burning. Strange sight. And when the Lord saw that he'd gone over, he called Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. And what did he say? Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Now sometimes God uses the most strangest and unprepared and insufficient, weakest things that he can do, but he uses them in order for his glory to be manifest. Moses said, but I I, 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 I don't talk too good. We always have an excuse. I, my, my, but, 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 sir, I'm, 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 I, I'm 80 years old. Have we done this 40 years? I, but, what I go tell him? Who are you? Go tell him, Pharaoh, I am that I am has sent you. Yeah. But I'm so weak, God, what I do? And God gave him a stone, uh, gave him a, uh, a rod. What's in your hand? Boy, it becomes a rod in God's hand now. You use it. And he goes back to Egypt. 80 years old. Can you see, Dick, can I borrow you for just a moment, my brother? Dick Bell heading to Egypt. Come on. Now Dick's a little older than him, but, and Dick's not Moses, but you get the point. <laughs> he walks up to Pharaoh. It's not in the Charlton Heston. Let him go. Mr. Pharaoh, God said, let him go. He laughs. Who are you? I'm Moses. Who are you representing? God. Who's he? He just said for me to tell you, I am that I am. Said, let him go. And they laughed. Get away from me. Okay. But boy, if you see what I've seen, you're in for it, man. One miracle on top of another miracle to the point 
to the point that Pharaoh said, okay, I've had enough. The last plague of the ten that came upon Egypt, they were to take a lamb and sacrifice it and take the blood of that lamb with hyssop and put it upon the doorpost and the lentils of the house for that and pack your bags because tomorrow you're leaving. I've seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cries and I have come down. It may not be the way you think I'm coming, but I have come down. It may not be the way you look for him to come, but I come through this man called Moses, and he's got my word, and yes, he's got a rod. That's all it's going to take. Pharaoh has his chariots. Pharaoh has his horses. Pharaoh has his armament. Pharaoh has his buggies. Pharaoh has all of his equipment, of, uh, one of the greatest fighting machines of all time. But you've got this 80-year-old man with a stick. That's all you're going to need. <laughs> Hallelujah! That's all you're going to need, this old man with a stick. And they obeyed him. And they put that blood upon the lintel. And that night, they were all hunkered down, and the death angel came through. And you could hear the screams of Egypt, all the firstborn boys dying. And the next morning, they broke camp, and out the door they go. And man, they're on their way, just going. Moses out front, follow me, follow me, follow me. And there they go. They get to a Red Sea, and they had to stop. There's a big body of water there called the Red Sea. They can't go to the left and go to the right because of the mountains, and they can't turn around because you know what they see in the distance? They see smoke rising, dust rising out of the sand dunes because here comes the horses. They can hear them galloping. They can hear the wheels of the chariots as they're going through that sand. Uh, they can see the ears of those horses peeled back and the snort coming out of their nose with the fire coming out of the nose of those horses, basically. And they go, you know, I think he's mad. They're going to kill us. And here they are at the Red Sea, and they've seen miracle. It took a miracle to get them to Egypt. It took a miracle to get them out of Egypt. And here they are ready to die at the Red Sea. Are we going to stay here another four and thirty years, Lord? I mean, come on. What do we do? We obeyed you. Look, the enemy's pursuing. He's pursuing. What are we going to do, God? We're going to die right here. Moses sitting there. I don't know how long they sat there. I don't know what kind of murmuring it took. I don't know what, what do you think they said. I know people. We follow this old geezer down here. We're going to die. God does only things halfway. He don't finish things all the way through. We saw miracles. Ever. We need one here. We're going to die. Is that what we do? We panic. We see God do one thing for us. He brings us here. We go, oh, God. Wait, the same God that moved here is the same God going to move here. Yeah. The same God that did that is the same God going to come through where you are right now. Hold on. And here's the point. I, I want you to get this. I don't know if I can articulate it right. Moses, what you got in the hand? A rod stretches forth, and the water's congealed. Hey, yo, come on. And there they go on dry ground. Now here comes Pharaoh and the horses. Why did God wait for Pharaoh, or why did God wait for the Red Sea to part? God waited long enough for the enemy to catch up with them. What brought deliverance to the nation of Israel brought destruction to Egypt. The thing God used to bring deliverance to his people is the very same thing he used to bring destruction and death to his enemy. And where you are right now, don't be concerned, friend. I know you are, but trust God because the very thing that you've seen miracle and miracle and miracle, and here you are at the Red Sea of your life, it could be that things are not moving right now because God is waiting for the enemy to catch up with you because the very thing that God has used to bring your deliverance could be the very thing that God will use to bring destruction to the enemy of your soul, whatever it may be, with disease, whatever it may be, the enemy, whatever it may be, habit, whatever it may be. God can take care of it because he sees, he hears, he comes down. And the deliverance may come through the most unlikely people or unlikely person or unlikely circumstance in your life. Look for God to show up, friends. Amen. We all have entertained angels unaware. And there have been times in our life that God has used things and used circumstances, used people. We look for this bionic guy to come or the hawk to come, and here comes some old 80-year-old man with a word that we need. I've seen God do it over and over again. Yes. My point is, the very thing designed for your deliverance could be designed to destroy the enemy of your soul.
Had God not done it that way, Egypt and Pharaoh would still have been chasing the people of Israel while they were going through the wilderness. God knows what he's doing, church, even when we don't understand it. Friends, trust God's wisdom in your situation. Trust God's love and concern for you in your situation. Trust God's grace and favor in your situation. Trust God even when you don't understand. Trust God when everything inside you is hurting. Trust God because he sees, he hears, he knows, and God will deliver you and help you, sustain you, and direct you out of your pain, direct you out of your suffering, direct you out of your confusion. In other words, as Charles Spurgeon says, give the Lord credit for knowing things you don't understand. Give the Lord credit for knowing things that you do not understand. And let me close by saying, God has a thousand ways to answer every prayer. But all we need is the one. Satan overplayed himself when God's son Jesus Christ came to this world. Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to give salvation, to pay a holy price to a righteous God. God said, the soul that sins will die. But I love this world so much, I'm not going to let them go to hell. So God said, I'm going to be just and justify. In other words, I'm going to provide the means whereby they can be saved and forgiven. But I'm going to be just in doing. In other words, I've, I've, I've provided the, the lamb, I've provided the sacrifice, and that within itself has justified and met my righteous demands. That's why God is just and justifier. Satan saw to it that Jesus was hung on the cross. He saw to it that he was buried. Put soldiers around the tomb. Put a lock on it. Nobody coming out of here. Nobody messing with that. But Jesus said, go ahead and destroy this body. Three days later, it'll come back to life. Freely I lay my life down. Freely I will pick it up again. Go ahead and mock my name. Go ahead and crucify me. Go ahead and say I'm dead and gone, but I will rise again. Amen. Amen. And on that third day, while they were having a party in the underworld, the earthquake took place. The stone was moved not to let Jesus Christ out, but to prove he came out. He took the keys of death into the grave. And he said, I am he that was alive and I died, but behold, I am. Glory alive forevermore. Yes. The same God that met Moses at the burning bush on Mount Horeb is the same Jesus that came out of God that came out of that tomb, yes. the great I Am. I'm here to tell you, friends, Satan thought death is what's going to take care of Jesus. No. God devised the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to defeat Satan. Are you with me? That which was designed to bring victory to the child of God was designed to bring defeat to the enemy of our soul. And we overcome every day by the word of our testimony and by the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. God has a thousand ways to answer the prayer you have this morning. I want to tell you, friend, I sense God in this place. I'm not worrying about a feeling. I sense Almighty God in this place today. Amen.